From 36 to 1950, the New York Yankees were Joe DiMaggio and Joe DiMaggio alone. He was a kind of artist, a consummate artist who could hit, who could field, who could run, and who didn't want the allure of fans. He only wanted to play. Joe DiMaggio, the man, is a very, very complex character. He has no education. He has no language other than his bat and his ability to play or his sexual prowess, which everybody talks about. But nobody really knows. We cannot ask Marilyn Monroe. He had this ability always to look beautiful in whatever he did on the field. But once you got off the field, he was a complete mess because everything that helped him deserted him. He was a kind of idiot savant. The romance between Joe and Marilyn was very strange. She was a woman who liked to go places. Joe was a guy who liked to sort of hit, sit behind a television screen, have his TV dinner, and go to bed. That was not the woman that Marilyn was. But he was the only man who never really exploited her. I call him in my book the demon lover because once Marilyn dies, he remains utterly devoted and faithful to her. Now, he was going to remarry Marilyn, and she agreed to remarry him, but she died a few days before this marriage was going to take place. He buries her on the very day they were going to be remarried. The New York Yankees were one of the two last teams to integrate in, in baseball, the Yankees and the Red Sox. And Joe DiMaggio said nothing about Jackie Robinson during this period, so it's very sad. So for me, this is the one sort of breach in the notion of Joe as a hero. But one has to be true to what he did or what he didn't do. In his own time, the streak was not really talked about except in 1941. This is a nation going to war, and suddenly you had this man of stability. You have to understand, it's not that he hits in 56 games. It's that he hits in game after game after game. You can depend on him. You can count on him. In a very scary, scary time, suddenly there's Joe DiMaggio. When we talk about Joe's legacy, uh, there's a very sad story because um, he was christened the greatest living baseball player in, in, in the 60s after Marilyn died. So anytime he was introduced, he had to be introduced as the greatest living ball play, he had to be introduced last, and if the cheers for Mickey Mantle were louder than his, he would get very upset. So from the year 2000 on, he's put down, he's disparaged, he's made fun of. There's a poem in the New Yorker about him which shows him as a skin flint. And it seems to me that this is incredibly unfair. He was a great man. He's a man who was celebrated, who was a man who didn't know his own limitations. And we have to sort of accept him in terms of who he was and of who he tried to be.